Ask her if she can sing a song. Sing a song, Kayla. Well, I think I'm pretty good at singing. Here's a song I love to sing to my next door neighbor's little girl. Twinkle, twinkle. But my friend Kayla also has some issues. She sings and talks and listens, but maybe a little too well. We're very concerned about the fact that these dolls are essentially spying on your kids' private conversations. Claire Gartland is with the Electronic Privacy Information Center, a Washington nonprofit that advocates for consumer privacy. The problem with Kayla, she says, is everything a child tells her can be recorded in the guise of having an interactive conversation. Ask her, say, can I tell you a secret? Sure, go ahead. Be very quiet, though. I promise not to tell anyone. It's just between you and me because we are friends. But Gartland says that secret and anything else your child tells or asks Kayla isn't secret at all. If the doll is connected to a smartphone as it's designed to be, that information can be sent to the toy maker. And that's troubling. There's all kinds of intimate details of their personal life, their parents' personal lives. You know, we know how kids at you know, younger ages don't necessarily have the same social filter. So these children could be chattering on about anything. Gartland says the conversations that Kayla records are sent to servers at the toy maker, a company called Genesis, and to a third party called Nuance that makes voice recognition software for a lot of companies. Nuance also has a database used by law enforcement and military and intelligence agencies that matches voice prints. In a blog post, Nuance says it does not share voice data collected from its customers Customers with any of its other customers, Genesis did not return calls for comment. Gartland says parents are not being sufficiently notified of my friend Kayla's capabilities. And more importantly, they're not consenting to this. And that's where some of our legal regulations come into play here. The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act requires companies that collect and use private information from children 12 and under notify their parents and get permission first. The Electronic Privacy Information Center and other privacy advocates have filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission about Kayla. Ideally, they'd like to see the toy and its sibling, IQ Intelligent Robot, taken off the shelves in the U.S., as has happened in some European countries. Brian Naylor, NPR News, NYC, and Tom Dotan, a reporter for the website The Information. Tom, before the break, I read you Devon's tweet on Twitter. Meanest mom in the world here won't let my 12-year-old have one of these devices because I'm not comfortable with the data it collects. Am I wrong? Tom, what do you think? Is she wrong? Uh, well, certainly she's not wrong if she's uh, concerned about the, uh, the incident that Manus mentioned earlier of someone ordering something without her permission. Uh, that's very easily done with one of those devices. In terms of data collection, it's a bit unclear right now. Amazon has been pretty upfront about the fact that there's no real data collection happening with these devices. It's more about instructional, you know, A to B type transactions. Um, but it's not impossible to think that they will be using it. I mean, certainly when you have a company like Google building a device like the Google Home, uh, Google is essentially a data company. Their whole currency is collecting as much data as possible so they can have targeted advertising, which is their big pitch of why you know, marketers should use them versus television. Um, and so while it may not be happening yet uh, to a, a great extent, it's just not impossible to think that it's, that it's, it, that it's going to be a major part of how these devices are, are central to their businesses. So I would say it's more precautionary than directly a problem. But, you know, if you want to be over, over concerned about these things or, or rightfully concerned about it, um, it's, it's not a bad decision. Manish, what would you say to this mom? I mean, I would say I think she has a really good point, and she's not alone. Uh, there's a Pew uh, study that said that um, being in control of who can get information about us and what they do with it is very important to 74% of Americans. It's it's not like you know Americans have given up on this right to privacy. The problem is that we're defining privacy differently, right? It used to be the right to be left alone. That your home is your castle, but now it's really this right to control our identity and our information. And I think there's a reason why a lot of us feel creepy. It's because not only do we not understand how a lot of this stuff works, 
when we ask for answers from a lot of these companies, we also don't find out. ProPublica did a great uh, investigation a couple months ago into how Facebook segments the population and targets them. One of the things they discovered was ethnic affinity is something that they can do. And they, uh, ProPublica learned that they could put in a, an ad about a housing conference and they were able to leave out certain ethnic groups we we don't know how and i think you know the people making these things i don't think there there's maliciousness involved here i think we just don't know what some of the societal implications are of some of these algorithms in theory they should be the most fair things that are out there but of course there are humans writing these programs and things get built into them it's why it's, there's algorithmic bias is a big topic right now too let's listen to another audience question this one's from shelby my name is Shelby Reap. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. A friend and I were having a conversation and I noticed an accessory that she had on her phone and I asked her about it. And then later that day in my Facebook feed, I started seeing ads for that accessory. Tom Dotan, what do you make of that? <laughs> uh, hard to say with these situations here uh, because there's sort of like the confirmation bias that I think people often have. As in, God, I was just talking about this, now I see the ad. Most likely in that situation, probably what happened is, is she Googled it, or there was some, there was maybe her friend had posted about it on her wall. I gotta or disagree. There was... We've heard from okay. our listeners hundreds of stories of people saying where they've had a conversation with someone, and the next day something pops up um, in, their, in their browser, an ad for the very same thing. And I just... I've heard the story so many times, I've had it happen to me personally, and when we ask, everyone's like, well, you know, technically that's not really possible, but I, I, I don't know what the explanation is for that. So, I, I, and this is why people start to act a little, you know, worried and paranoid, or, or as Walter yeah. Kern, the writer said, if you're not paranoid, then you are crazy. Well, you certainly don't want to be an, an, an sorry. I don't mean to cut off. Go ahead. I'd want to say you, you don't want to be an apologist for, for these companies. Their jobs, it, you know, are data collection. That is what how their businesses run, and they will pursue every avenue possible. As it stands right now, Facebook, for example, you know, they do have the ability to to you know have your phone's microphone on, and there is some sort of audio collection that that goes on through there. They maintain over and over again. None of it has to do with targeted advertising and and they do have you know some sort of a, an, an excuse there in that it just wouldn't be useful to collect every single piece of audio data that someone has and try to parse it for information use it for targeted advertising um, but again the possibility is there and people are right to be concerned about it because the technology is all there it's in our pockets and now with these you know echo and Google Home devices, they're in our homes. So if it's not happening now, it's entirely possible to think that it will happen in the not too distant future. Here's an email from Christine in Bethesda, Maryland. The Amazon Echo was the number one tech gift this holiday season. Why weren't all the privacy concerns discussed publicly before everyone purchased them as gifts? Did Amazon and Google put a lid on the discussion? I gave three to family members after reading reviews in the Wall Street Journal and other media that said nothing about these concerns. Manoush, I assume that you are among the people who are particularly concerned that we're not talking about this more. Well, I think that that comment from your listener really illustrates the sort of like the way that we talk about technology, right? There's right now there is there's the consumer side, which is a how the product works. Is, is it effective? Does it do what it says it's going to do? So I read all those reviews, too, and it sounds amazing. And then you flip over to a different section of, you know, whatever website you're reading or if you're still reading the newspaper. And that's where the privacy sort of legal societal discussion is taking place. And I think where we are need to be is a, a nexus. I mean, what we're seeing is that. Uh, these machines, yeah, they they do work beautifully, They, but we need to connect it to the cultural implications and have a broader discussion about how we balance the wonderful conveniences and information we can get with the sort of rights and questions. And so I would have loved to have seen a lot of those reviews include at least a line or two about some of the privacy concerns that there are. Because I know those same reviewers talk about those things. I talk to them, you know, out and about, right? I know that they're thinking about these things. Tom, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And, and one of the most important things that I think the public can do is, is ask these questions and, you know, for reporters, keep getting more and more answers from, you know, the companies, the tech companies themselves as to how they're using this information. I mean, like the, the Amazon Echo, you know, murder case that, that I wrote about, 
Uh, for, for me, it was an opportunity to really press into Amazon, what exactly are you guys collecting? How are you going to be able to use this? And what are the larger implications of it? And I think the more people raise these valid concerns and you know, ask the companies, what are you doing with this information, the more they have to be as upfront uh, with the public about these things. So again, it, even if right now we may not be seeing this mass collection of audio data that, that some people are afraid of, um, it's, it's entirely possible that it's going to happen, and people people need to be vigilant about it. We got it. Joshua, I just oh, saw. Go ahead, that, sorry, I, I just saw that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has said that his New Year's resolution is to go on sort of a listening tour of the United States huh. and talk to people. And I think it's partly because you know between the echo chambers and filter bubbles, that fake news issues that we've been hearing about, there's pushback from the American consumer in a way that there there wasn't maybe a year or two ago. There is a sort of awakening that is happening of how powerful these devices and platforms can be. And so I would say one thing you can do if Mark Zuckerberg is coming to your town, go and ask him, how do you, how does Facebook work? What are you looking for? Give Put the pressure on him if it is something that you use every day because you deserve those answers. Um, and also we're trying to figure them out. We're doing a project with our listeners at the end of this month with NPR that we would love to invite people. We're gonna experiment with changing our behavior and seeing how it affects our concept of our technology and our privacy. So I would invite people to join us there too. Well, but I have to wonder, how much of this responsibility do we just put on consumers to be smart consumers? I mean, I just, what I while you were talking, I just searched online Facebook terms of service. And within that, I hit control F to do fine. And I looked for the words, audio, listen, hear, sound, microphone, and none of them was in the terms of service. So for me, that makes me think, okay, well if Facebook is collecting audio information and using it to feed ads, they might be doing it outside of the terms of service. But it, the agreement would not have warned me about that. In fact, with some of these devices, as I found out yesterday playing with one of them, and I'm sorry to those of you listening because it's about to go off because I'm gonna call <laughs> its name, if you ask, It'll actually answer the question. Alexa, are you recording me? I only send audio back to Amazon when I hear you say the wake word. For more information and to view Amazon's privacy notice, visit the help section of your Alexa app. So at what point do we put the responsibility back on ourselves and say, hey, if we want to know, we're the ones who have to start asking. Tom? Yeah, you know what's funny, uh, before I answer your question, I thought uh, um, the Echo's response to your question was a little bit squirmy on her part because you asked, are you recording? And she said, I only send data to Amazon when you use the wake word. Well, that's not necessarily the answer to your question, though, because there is some data that is stored locally on the device. Uh -huh. I mean, not too much, but the, the fact is that the microphones are always on. Now, I'm not saying there is a catch of, of audio data on the device, but again, that is a part of the construction and engineering of the product that Amazon is not being clear about. And, you know, it's important for people to ask this of Amazon so that they will clarify these things. Mm -hmm. um, and now, I would in, also in terms add of. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead, I was just going to yeah. say, they, yeah, I was just going to say that they change the terms of service all the time, and they don't, I think it's probably in the terms of service that they don't have to tell you when they change the terms of service. So that, that could be something one guy told me, a listener, that his wife actually filed for divorce after Facebook changed its privacy settings and revealed that he belonged to an atheist Bible study group. You know, we don't, he thought he was being private and he wasn't. Hey Manoush, where are you going? Is there anyone, and I'm not asking you to be a name dropper, but just if there are resources that you know of that mm. are good for following terms of service, is there anyone in the tech press, and maybe Tom, you're doing this, who's actually covering these changes that the average person could just go watch or go to their website every now and then to keep up? Or is this yeah, a gap in journalism today? Uh, well, I think the problem is there's so long and there's so many of them. There was a researcher at Carnegie Mellon who found that it would take you more than 201 hours to read all the privacy policies you come across the year and that that was worth about three and a half thousand dollars per American internet user every year. Um, there are some great places doing uh, work epic, I would say, the Electronic Privacy Information Center in, in Washington near you, um, EFF. Um, Electronic um, Frontier Foundation as well. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of places. Uh, Mozilla is doing a lot of work on this too. The We're people gonna... who make Firefox. Exactly. Yep, they're doing work on this as well. Um, I don't know, Tom. What about you? What sort of resources do you go to? 
Well, we certainly write about it as much as we can at the information, but there are other news sites. I think um, ZDNet is one out there that's, that's mm -hmm. tried to kind of focus as much on, on internet security as possible. And a few of the other consumer sites, you know, when a case similar to like the, the Echo one, which has kind of a more uh, consumer focus on it comes up, uh, they do a bit of uh, uh, reporting on it, but it's, uh, it's tough to find. And I think, you know, the resources that you mentioned, certainly kind of consumer advocacy groups like that are, are probably the best way to go whose job it is specifically to kind of be a watchdog for these tech companies and provide as much information to the public as possible. We're low on time, so let's get to at least one more listener comment. Aaron tweeted us, what about malware using these devices for cyber attacks? Tom, what do we know about the potential for malicious actors to use these and do real harm? Boy, it's, uh, it's tough to tell right now. Um, Amazon and, and certainly Google want to make it as clear as possible that they have built these devices to be incredibly secure, that they're, it, it's, they'll say it's impossible for someone to hack into it. But if there's sort of one thing that we've learned over the last few years with hackers is that nothing is impossible and they will always find a way. So you don't want to be alarmist about these things and say all of your devices are vulnerable right now and you could be, you know, the Russian government could be listening in on you right now. But the fact of the matter is when you're buying one of these things, you have a device that has seven microphones that are always on in your home. Um, and as good as the security that Amazon and the other tech companies have built in on it um, is, uh, there's just a possibility, a possibility that, that one of these things could be, could be taken over uh, by some nefarious or, or potentially non-nefarious actor. And I don't know of any examples of this happening yet, but I almost want to say it's, it's, it could be a matter of time before we see you know, precedent set in the same way that you know, the, the Amazon Echo being used in a murder trial is in a way precedent set for mm -hmm. how data collection of these devices can happen. Manoush, I understand that you do not have an Amazon Echo, nor are you on Facebook. Is that so? Yeah, no, I, for multiple reasons with Facebook, the creepiness factor, I just could never get over it. Um, it felt uh, it, too invasive to me. And I have to say, you know, I, I, every single day I was like, huh, maybe today's the day I get on Facebook. But as a tech journalist, every day I also learn more about what we don't know about how these things work, um, at ad targeting, uh, the potential for hackers. And um, so I've decided to hold off for now. We do have a nest at home, I will say. I have the smart regrets. thermostat. Yes, the smart thermostat, but I have regrets. Oh, like um, right. Wait, you regret getting, yeah. well, let me, let me ask you this, because we gotta land this plane in just a second. What's the one yeah. thing that the tech companies behind these speaking computers could do to convince you to put one in your home? Let me ask you both. Manoush? Well, I would like to see a HIPAA, you know, some sort of oath that we have for physicians, um, medical pro data. I would love to see the same thing for developers and for tech companies. So HIP, uh, just to clarify, HIPAA is the law that says that your health information belongs to you and no one has a right to see it unless you consent, right? That's correct, yes. So something comparable for the spoken data would do it for you. Mm -hmm. Tom, what about you? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to admit that I do have an Amazon Echo in my house, and I'm also on Facebook, and probably give my data to tech companies in a myriad of other ways. So I'm probably at the, at the other end of the spectrum from Manoush, but what I really demand from, from these tech companies, and I think all consumers uh, should demand, is transparency. And you know, the legal uh, agreements that you all click through absentmindedly when you get one of these things really isn't enough. I think there should be a much more clear statement on their part of exactly how this information is being used. Uh, my concern with, with the HIPAA agreements is that it just strikes me as something that will be violated. It's just the nature of these companies. I mean, we have to recognize that we are the product. As the user, we are the product. They are selling us to advertisers um, in order for marketers to reach us. And so I, I think all you can really do is be an informed consumer and for the tech companies, do everything that they can to make sure that the public is informed in a language, uh, you know, in a, in a level of disclosure that is easy to understand. And so we just know what we're getting into when we buy these devices. Because it's not... Yes, Tom, 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 Tom no for on. the information. Tom, sorry to cut you off, but we got to end the hour. So thank right. you for being with us, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. And Manoush Zamarodi, the host of the podcast Note to Self from WNYC Studios. Manoush, thank you. WAMU from TuneIn. Timothy Martin writes about this in today's Wall Street. There you go. All things considered, it can play the radio for you if you want, whatever your local NPR station is. Alexa, stop. So it can be highly useful, sometimes comical when the computer misunderstands you, and sometimes maybe it can feel a little intrusive. Having high quality microphones listening for your commands all the time means they are always listening to you. In Bentonville, Arkansas, Prosecutors have a warrant for recordings from the Amazon Echo of a murder suspect. 
At issue is whether the device was active and collected useful data when an apparent homicide took place. We'll start with that case in this hour of 1A as we consider how to live our lives when your computer is always listening. Joining me now is Tom Dotan, a reporter who covered this case for the website The Information. He joins us from the studios of KQED Public Radio in San Francisco. Tom, welcome to 1A. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Also with me in studio is Ron Hosko, the president of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund and also the former assistant director of the FBI's Criminal Investigative Division. Ron, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Tom, let me start with you. Walk us through this case. How did the police in Bentonville come to seek a warrant for this data? Well, uh, through the process of investigating this case, which just for a little bit of background, um, the, uh, the accused here is, is James Bates, uh, who uh, had a couple of friends over to his place, and um, they all went to sleep. They had quite a bit to drink uh, the, the night before, and then waking up, James Bates finds uh, one of his guests, Victor Collins, dead in his hot tub. He proceeds to, to call the police, and through investigation, they decide to, to press first-degree murder charges against uh, Mr. Bates. And in the investigation process, they find one of these Amazon Echoes on his kitchen counter, and um, just through the, again, investigation process and, and into discovery, they issue a warrant to Amazon just trying to get all the data that could have been on this device. Now, Amazon released a statement saying that it would not release customer information without a valid and binding legal demand properly served on us. It said, quote, Amazon objects to overbroad or otherwise inappropriate demands as a matter of course, unquote. Now, Amazon has given up some data so far, hasn't it? Yeah, what they've given up so far is basically customer data. So uh, a purchase history and some basic kind of account information uh, that, that Mr. Bates has. Uh, but it hasn't given up anything in terms of the actual data that could be on the Echo. So data that's stored on Amazon servers that displays the interaction history between uh, Mr. Bates and his device. What kind of precedent is there for something like this where a connected home device is used for evidence in a case like this? So far as I can tell, none. Um, you know, we, in the process of, you know, reporting out this story, reached out to a number of privacy experts and district attorney offices and people who would be dealing with this kind of stuff. And uh, so far as they know, this is the first time that anyone has ever issued a warrant for uh, an Amazon Echo and maybe beyond that kind of to the level that this case is involved with, internet connected devices. Ron Hosko, your organization deals with legal advocacy for law enforcement officers, some pro bono work for officers and their families. I wonder what your take is on this. I mean, the Fourth Amendment protects us from unreasonable search and seizure. How is law enforcement thinking through its relationship to these devices, this data, in terms of trying to solve crimes? I think, Josh, it is uh, iterative. Um, we are in this new uh, era of technology. We have been in it. Uh, law enforcement, I think, is uh, trying to stay caught up with not only developments in technology, but in court decisions uh, impacting their ability to collect evidence. And as you rightly note, the, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. That, that uh, amendment, that pr those protections are not, not absolute. And so further in the, uh, in the Fourth, it says, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and so here i think the uh, the police department and the prosecutors are doing exactly the right thing they believe they have evidence uh the potential for evidence that is being stored in a particular location and they want access to that evidence to help solve a crime talk about how law enforcement organizations are learning about the extent of these machines, the kind of data that goes through them, what officers have to do to get at the data. What is the, nas nationally, what does it look like when something this new comes along and every police department in the country basically has to learn a whole new form of evidence? Yeah, I think that is one of the biggest challenges here. We're talking about not only uh, the FBI, um, but we're talking about put the potential for 18,000 some police departments across the country some of which are very tiny, uh, most of which are relatively small, uh, where they don't have internal legal experts. They have to depend on a district attorney's office. And so it is very much a patchwork across America. And that is one of the great challenges of law enforcement in this country. Now, there are uh, publications, there are associations 
IACP, uh, you know, the uh, Major City Chiefs Association, the Fraternal Order of Police. The IACP is the International Association of Chiefs of Police. That's right. That's right. And so there are uh, you know fraternal organizations and associations that try to look for emergent issues and publish information, uh, reports, uh, legal su summaries of uh, where the law is today that helps to bring people abreast of those issues. However, those publications don't reach everyone, and so you're going to see this kind of continual patchwork across America uh, in, in, in an area that is anything but settled law. We're talking about voice-activated computers in our daily lives with Tom Dotan of The Information and Ron Hosko of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. But I'd love to hear from you as well. How have you dealt with computers listening to you? Share what's happened to you and how you dealt with it. Give us a call, 855-236-1A1A. That's 855-236-1212. Email us, 1A at WAMU.org. Comment on Facebook or tweet us. We are at 1A. Tom Dotan, you also wrote in your piece for the information that the police in Bentonville, Arkansas, may have obtained some data from a smart water meter in the suspect's home. How does that connect to this case? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating part of this case. And, and to be honest, it may be the piece that really the prosecution's case really, really uh, hinges on. Um, so these smart meters are devices that usually are, are placed in the utility offices, and it can measure the amount of water usage that a house has uh, over the course of a certain, certain amount of time. So whereas a regular meter might just be able to say overall how much, uh, how much water is being used, these can actually point it to a specific time and place, uh, or a specific time in this matter. And um, in this case, what's happened here is the police have seen that the smart water meters showed that between, I think, 1 and 3 a.m., uh, Mr. Bates's residence used uh, around 140 gallons of water which was a highly unusual amount, I mean, much more than it would be during that time period. And they are theorizing that it was during this time period that, uh, you know, Mr. Bates used uh, a hose to kind of spray away the evidence that was on his patio. Um, you know, as police came over to, to the house, they found quite a bit of blood there, uh, but also quite a bit of water around the hot tub. And they are theorizing that um, it was during this time period that he kind of took out the hose and, and sprayed away as much of the evidence as he possibly could. Uh, the defense is, of course, alleging that these water meters are highly inaccurate. It's themselves an invasion of privacy, and actually the AM and PM might have been off, and it was actually 1 and 3 PM that he was using this amount of water to fill up the hot tub. So it's interesting with these devices. In one sense, they give you a ton of information, and it seems like a lot more kind of specificity of what happened. And at the same time, you know, you can start poking holes in the technology itself. I wonder, Ron, if you would address a few comments that we've already gotten so far from Twitter. Cole commented, the only way to stop anyone from listening to what you're saying is to physically disconnect the mic. Dan tweeted, giving law enforcement access to digital assistant data is a dangerous and slippery slope. How would you reassure people about the way that law enforcement uses these data? Well, first, uh, I, I would recommend people understand the Fourth Amendment and the, the, um, the exceptions to the Fourth Amendment. Of course, law enforcement does not need a search warrant for everything. And in fact, there are a number of exceptions, you know, plain view being one of them, investigative stops that are brief, uh, searches incident to arrest, searches of abandoned property. One of the other notable ones that I think we all ought to pay attention to is what's known as the third party exception. And that is premised on that if I am voluntarily giving information to a third party, that I don't, I have a lesser expectation of privacy in that data because I'm already sharing it with another. And that relates to cell phone information, uh, cell phone usage, hard line usage, who I'm calling, how long I'm on the phone with a particular number. So I want to make sure I'm clear because we're coming up to our first break. You're saying that if I'm saying something to a computer that's run by human beings on a human network, that I'm demonstrating that the data I would speak is clearly not super private to me as other pieces of information and that lowers the bar somewhat. I think that argument can be made here because that data is being stored at the home office of, in this case, Amazon. So I'm transmitting it to a third party, essentially voluntarily, it's part of the system, and that our, our expectation of privacy in that, in that circumstance ought to be lesser than a, a conversation that is entirely within my home. 
I'm sure it'll be interesting to see how you know case law begins to refine this over time. As you said, it's super early for law enforcement for the legal system in general. That's Ron Hosko of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. Ron, thanks for spending your time with us. My pleasure. Just ahead, we'll get to some more of your questions, some of your stories, and we'll look at how governments, tech companies, and everyday people are adapting to our increasingly connected world. Share your stories of how you're dealing with these smart devices. 1A at WAMU.org. Tweet us at 1A or comment on Facebook. I'm Joshua. Keep it for the user's benefit uh, or because the government has prospectively met process to say this particular person we want to surveil. Uh, I have a colleague, Dan Gear, who likens it almost to just toxic waste. The barrels just pile up and sooner or later something's going to leak. Is there any way for us to have the benefits that these apps and devices offer while increasing the amount of privacy we have? Do we have to have the terms of service be quite the way that they are? Or is there room for us to, to make the systems even more private and even more respectful of our privacy? Oh, there are some amazing potential technologies and practices that could lead to a day-to-day -day much more private and secure world and it's just a question of whether the companies uh, in question will find it worth it to implement those technologies and whether politically we'll see uh, governments willing to help uh, have those be implemented. But an example of a technology like this I think would be first one in which we are made aware. Like it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your data is? There are all sorts of technologies that could help answer that question. I could also see technologies that would allow people to take data that they don't even need immediately, but might want for sentimental or historical purposes to be able to encrypt it, possibly with a key that they'd share with a few friends. And only when all the friends or some subset come together to match their keys, like Harry Potter horcruxes, can you get to that data again? That's a way of trying to secure stuff so that it can't casually be compromised if you happen to type a password into the wrong site. Ten points, by the way, for making the Harry Potter reference. I really like that. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to admit, I, I enjoy that. And, and hopefully that the horcruxes for your data will not get destroyed one by one and that data <laughs> exactly. disappears. But, but let, for people who haven't read the book, we'll just, we'll just go back into the main line of the conversation. Do you use Alexa or Siri or Cortana or Google Assistant? I don't, as a matter of fact. None of them. I'm not saying I never would, but uh, I don't right now. Why not? I'm waiting for the AI to get a little bit better, for one thing. But the other thing is there really are some privacy concerns with it. You are sticking a massive microphone in the middle of your house, and uh, it's it could be turned on. There are circumstances, I think, when there will be temptation by authorities, certainly in other countries, if not the United States, to say, I want to do a dragnet, turn on every Alexa, uh, every uh, microphone that you can find, and wait to hear a certain phrase or something. And if you hear that phrase that we think is sensitive, then suddenly we'll zoom in and, and give more scrutiny. Okay, let me slow you down there, because I, I, I have to understand exactly what's wrong with that. Now, you made a Harry Potter reference, I'm going to make a Batman reference. The Dark Knight, at the end of the movie where he turns yeah. all the cell phones into microphones and he saw our images Gotham City to yeah. catch a terrorist, basically. Yes. Doesn't the law allow for us to do that? Isn't there some aspect of the USA Patriot Act or some other federal law that would allow us in an extreme circumstance to say, Alexa, listen to the nation to try to catch something imminent, something awful, a threat to the president, a bomb that's going to go off, a bridge that's going to be destroyed, someone who's going to be abducted. Wouldn't we be allowed to do that now in an extreme case? No. The current answer, I think, is no. The law does not allow, because not allow us to do that at all. I think that's right. The uh, Constitution was designed, the Fourth Amendment was designed to abjure the general warrant. The idea that you can kick in doors all the way down the street, house to house, looking for that fugitive, that's not how it works. You need to have some probable cause or consent by a given homeowner. Hey, why do I take a look around your house? There's been a fugitive in the neighborhood in order to do that. When you start thinking about suddenly getting a window into every person's home and seeing what's there just to see if it happens to be the place where the bad thing is, um, that is a model of search very, very uncommon 
uh, in our legal tradition, and one for which if there were any real desire or perceived need to do it, we'd really have to work through how that would work. It sounds like absent some kind of change in federal law that would allow that kind of a digital dragnet, your main reason for keeping away from these devices today is that it just is kind of creepy. It just, you seem to be a little bit just icked out on a personal level at having a digital mic in your house all the time. It, it may be a little too intimate to be that close with Amazon or Apple all the time. Is it just the human ick factor that makes this tough? Certainly that, but I don't think it's just a form of uh, kind of inchoate fear. It actually has to do with the prospect that there is telemetry going back from that microphone uh, to places that I can't audit, that may be vulnerable to third-party hacking, and uh, for which the company may or may not be my friend. Uh, when it comes to the custody of that sensitive information. And these are all things that can be improved. You can build technologies that make it clearer when surveillance is taking place. You can have occasional audits of the technologies to make sure they're not leaking. And you can have legal frameworks to protect uh, stuff the way that we protect tax returns, for example. The government might have our tax returns, but even internally, it has to present itself with uh, the right paperwork in order to get access uh, to a citizen's tax return. And if all of those things were in place, then would you buy one of those devices? Then would you buy an Alexa or use Siri? Oh yeah, quite possibly. I, I don't think I have any innate objection to uh, ha being able to say something instead of having to laboriously type it in on a keyboard whose autocomplete appears to be worse by the minute. <laughs> Jonathan Zittrain is a professor of law and computer science at Harvard University. He's the co-founder of Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and he just so happens to be teaching a course on the Echo case this week. Thanks for schooling us, Professor. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Pleasure. So even if it's not Batman-level spying, sometimes our devices can seem like they're watching our every move. Not for crime fighting, but for sales and advertising. We asked for some of your stories of feeling too connected, and here's one story we heard. My name's Gerald from Houston, Texas, and uh, one time whenever I was uh, coming in from a morning run, uh, my I connected my watch, uploaded it, uh, put it in Facebook, and then I saw an ad pop up in my Facebook feed for, I think it was Brooks Running Shoes, and then went to uh, my USA Today app, and then an ad for a Runner's World subscription popped up, and it was just kind of... Uh, strange thing that I noticed for the first time that uh, my actions, things that I was doing in my life showed up uh, on my phone and, and kind of influenced my ads that I was seeing and it just kind of kind of threw me for a loop when I saw it. Hey Gerald, thanks for sharing your comment and thank you for sharing it as a voice memo. It sounds lovely on the radio. Feel free to do that in the future. 1A at WAMU.org. Let's continue our conversation with reporter Tom Dotan of The Information. Also joining us is Manoush Zamarodi, the host of the podcast Note to Self from WNYC Studios. Manoush joins us now from WNYC in New York. Manoush, welcome to the program. Hey, Joshua. Congratulations. Sounding good. Well, thank you very much. Let me start with, just for that compliment, I'm going to start with you. Give us yeah. an idea of what these devices are actually listening for. What are they capable of capturing when we speak to them? Well, so what the companies say is that they are only turned on when you say the key words, right? So, OK, Google, that's the audio indication that Google's home device should turn on and start listening to what you're saying. Um, Alexa. When you say her name, you know, heaven forbid, you actually have someone named in your home, Alexa, um, that's when it supposedly turns on. And there's a buffer. There's a couple milliseconds before you actually start talking that it starts to record. This gets sent back to home base. It's analyzed. And then it tries to figure out what exactly you want. Now, there was a pretty funny story that came out this morning that um, some uh, little girl figured out how to order stuff off of Amazon and she ordered a humongous thing of uh, Christmas cookies and a new dollhouse for herself from Alexa. <laughs> um, so you know, this could go different ways. It could be it could be wonderful. You could be listening to every all of your favorite music all the time. On the other hand, you know, we don't I think this word that keeps coming up that I've been hearing this creepy factor is because we actually really don't know exactly how it works and um, with deep learning, with 
AI, uh, artificial intelligence, the algorithms are taking information from us and getting to understand how we talk, what, what exactly we want, but we don't know exactly what that means or the indication could be. And I've spoken to researchers who say, soon it won't be just what you say out loud, it will be what tone you say it. So they'll know your emotion. Oh, she sounds like she's having a bad day. Not to personify these devices, but they could be right. like, they could order you a case of wine. Who knows, right? <laughs> you sound like you need a drink right now. Tom, yeah. what do we know about what companies that collect this data are using it for? Do we know anything about where these data go? Uh, when you're talking about these internet-connected devices, uh, they're, they're very kind of literal right now. I, I, there's not too much interpretation uh, of certainly tone or anything like that, but even a broader sense of, of what you're trying to do other than the thing you're asking of it. So in the case of, you know, with these Amazon Echoes or Google Homes, uh, certainly the Amazon Echo because it's connected to, a, you know, an online retailer, they're just trying to get you to buy more things. Like the story that you brought up earlier about the girl that mistakenly, you know, or not mistakenly ordered some, some cookies. Um, that's exactly to an extent what Amazon wants to have happen. Certainly not unauthorized purchases, but it wants to get you to buy more things. And it, and it kind of simplifies that process by having you say it so simply like, you know, Alexa, buy me some cookies, which by the way, if anybody does have one of these, they may have just been charged with some cookies. So you should, you should check your purchase history. Yeah. And we've been um, getting a number of tweets. I have to say to, to those of you who are listening to this program in a speaker out loud, I know we're turning on your Amazon Echo over and over and over, and I'm really sorry. There's no other way for me to discuss that. Well, you there's know what? There's we, a button on the top that lets you do that. Right, there's a mute button. Like, maybe we should just describe it as the Amazon Echo so that people don't start to hate us <laughs> through the guise of, of that device that the Amazon Echo uses. I feel like I'm referring it to the artist formerly known as You Know Who, but we'll, we'll try not to use that wake word in the, in the course of this program. Of course, if that's happening, you can listen to the podcast later, but we'll try to be a little more sensitive to this. Tom, I wonder if you could talk about more of the business case of these devices. It occurs to me that the holy grail of search was never Google. It was the computer on Star Trek. It was being able to speak to a computer and get whatever you wanted. Not having to go to a physical user interface and interact with a computer the way computers want you to interact. This feels a little bit like future-proofing, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And there's no question that you know voice is the platform of choice right now uh, in, in Silicon Valley and, and beyond. They're trying to make it so it's as seamless as possible for you to get the things that you want. You know, with Google and the search engine, you were trying to get information. Now it's about, of course, information, but, but also purchasing. And that's why you're seeing right now there's the Consumer Electronics Show happening in Vegas. And really one of the big stories to come out of it so far are these voice platforms, these internet connected devices. Uh, Amazon even announced, or they and some partners announced that the, the uh, Amazon Echo software, I'm not gonna use her name, um, is going to be on non-Amazon devices. So, so LG uh, is going to be using that software in, in their stuff as well. And so you're really seeing a proliferation of the software out there trying to make it as ubiquitous and as seamless as possible for you to get the things that you want. I want to get to a few comments from our audience. Miriam wrote us on Twitter, and I'm going to have to change the name of the software so I don't wake it up. Miriam wrote us on Twitter, as a stay-at-home mom, my Amazon Echo is my best friend, a note taker, a music maker, and a hands-free timer. I use her all the time. And clearly there's an aspect of this software that is designed to be very personable and very cozy and to even have a sense of humor. Alexa, tell me a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Noah. No, who? Know any good songs for this time of day? Ha ha, Manu Samarodi, what do you think of this effort to try? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think of this effort to try to make these devices more personable? I mean, you can ask, you know, Siri, what's the meaning of life, and there's a response. So you can ask these devices, do you love me, and you'll get a response. What What do you make of that des desire to kind of humanize these machines? Well, sure, that makes sense because if you feel like you know Alexa, then you feel like you can trust her with your most intimate information. Um, I had a colleague show me 
his Alexa app on his phone or his Amazon Echo app and it he played me back all his nanny requests that day. There's an element of privacy here that I think we really need to, to question very deeply. The law is way behind all of this technology um, and the idea that you can spy on your employees or that perhaps Amazon will know something that's happening in your personal life in your home and suggest certain products based on that. Um, I, I don't feel very comfortable with that. Well, wait, but that ship has already kind of sailed, hasn't it? I mean, we're carrying a GPS tracker in our pockets with our smartphones. Mm. That ship is completely sailed. You could put a tile in the trunk of a company car to tell if it's actually going from the employee's home to the job or to work sites and back. Isn't this just kind of another logical extension of what we have already bought into? Isn't it too late? No, I, I don't think that that's the case at all. In fact, I think that 2017 this year is really going to be the tipping point um, for privacy. The government companies are facing mounting pressure to do more to protect our personal information. And you're seeing that consumers are also pushing back. You know, I've heard a lot from my listeners. We just did a survey with them, 2,000 of them. And they 57% of them had decided to get rid of an app because of their privacy practices, the app's privacy practices. 57% um, had also put false information to set up an account. Um, and basically what they're saying is, you know, there's getting to a point where we, there's going to be pushback. I've heard so many stories from people who say, uh, my spouse bought an Amazon Echo, and when he's not around, I unplug it because I'm just not comfortable with this. So there is definitely a sector of the population that is saying, you know, this stuff is helpful. It is convenient. We want the wonders of big data. This is what is going to solve a lot of our problems, climate control, societal uh, inequality. But we really need to solve this issue of who gets our data, who has control of it, and, and we need to know how we can protect ourselves, not just from hackers who want our social security number and credit card information, but people who want to know our most intimate selves, things that maybe we're not ready to give over just yet. Well, I do want to talk about solutions for the rest of this hour. Before we go to break, Devin wrote us on Twitter, meanest mom in the world here won't let my 12-year-old have one of these devices because I'm not comfortable with the data it collects. Am I wrong? Be interested to hear your responses to Devin or Devon, I beg your pardon, when we come back on the other side of this break and we'll get to some more of your comments about living with these smart NYC and Tom Dotan, a reporter for the website The Information. Tom, before the break, I read you Devon's tweet on Twitter. Meanest mom in the world here won't let my 12-year-old have one of these devices because I'm not comfortable with the data it collects. Am I wrong? Tom, what do you think? Is she wrong? Uh, well, certainly she's not wrong if she's uh, concerned about the, uh, the incident that Manus mentioned earlier of someone ordering something without her permission. Uh, that's e very easily done with one of those devices. In terms of data collection, it's a bit unclear right now. Amazon has been pretty upfront about the fact that there's no real data collection happening with these devices. It's more about instructional, you know, A to B type transactions. Um, but it's not impossible to think that they will be using it. I mean, certainly when you have a company like Google building a device like the Google Home, uh, Google is essentially a data company. Their whole currency is collecting as much data as possible so they can have targeted advertising, which is their big pitch of why you know, marketers should use them versus television. Um, and so while it may not be happening yet uh, to a, a great extent, it's just not impossible to think that it's that it's that it's going to be a major part of how these devices are are central to their businesses. So, I would say it's more precautionary than directly a problem. But you know, if you want to be over over concerned about these things or or rightfully concerned about it, um, it's it's not a bad decision. Manish, what would you say to this mom? I mean, I would say that I think she has a really good point, and she's not alone. Uh, there's a Pew uh, study that said that um, being in control of who can get information about us and what they do with it is very important to 74% of Americans. It's it's not like you know Americans have given up on this right to privacy. The problem is that we're defining privacy differently, right? It used to be the right to be left alone, that 
your home is your castle, but now it's really this right to control our identity and our information. And I think there's a reason why a lot of us feel creepy. It's because not only do we not understand how a lot of this stuff works, when we ask for answers from a lot of these companies, we also don't find out. ProPublica did a great uh, investigation a couple months ago into how Facebook segments the population and targets them. One of the things they discovered was ethnic affinity is something that they can do. And they, ProPublica learned that they could put in a, an ad about a housing conference and they were able to leave out certain ethnic groups. We, we don't know how, and I think, you know, the people making these things, I don't think there, there's maliciousness involved here. I think we just don't know what some of the societal implications are of some of these algorithms. In theory, they should be the most fair things that are out there, but of course there are humans writing these programs and things get built into them. It's why it's, there's algorithmic bias is a big topic right now too. Let's listen to another audience question. This one's from Shelby. My name is Shelby Reap. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. A friend and I were having a conversation and I noticed an accessory that she had on her phone and I asked her about it. And then later that day in my Facebook feed, I started seeing ads for that accessory. Tom Dotan, what do you make of that? <laughs> uh, hard to say with these situations here uh, because there's sort of like the confirmation bias that I think people often have as in, God, I was just talking about this, now I see the ad. Most likely in that situation, probably what happened is, is she Googled it, or there was some, there was maybe her friend had posted about it on her wall. I gotta or disagree. There was... We've heard from okay. our listeners hundreds of stories of people saying where they've had a conversation with someone, and the next day something pops up um, in, their, in their browser, an ad for the very same thing. And I just... I've heard the story so many times, I've had it happen to me personally, and when we ask, everyone's like, well, you know, technically that's not really possible, but I, I, I don't know what the explanation is for that. So I, 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 and this is why people start to act a little, you know, worried and paranoid, or, or as Walter yeah. Kern, the writer said, if you're not paranoid, then you are crazy. Well, you certainly don't want to be. An, 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 sorry, I don't mean to cut off. Go ahead. I want to say you, you don't want to be an apologist for, for these companies. Their jobs, it, you know, are data collection. That is what how their businesses run, and they will pursue every avenue possible. As it stands right now, Facebook, for example, you know, they do have the ability to to you know have your phone's microphone on, and there is some sort of audio collection that that goes on through there. They maintain over and over again. None of it has to do with targeted advertising. And, and they do have you know, some sort of a, an, an excuse there in that it just wouldn't be useful to collect every single piece of audio data that someone has and try to parse it for information, use it for targeted advertising. Um, but again, the possibility is there and people are right to be concerned about it because the technology is all there. It's in our pockets and now with these you know, Echo and Google Home devices, they're in our homes. So if it's not happening now, it's entirely possible to think that it will happen in the not too distant future. Here's an email from Christine in Bethesda, Maryland. The Amazon Echo was the number one tech gift this holiday season. Why weren't all the privacy concerns discussed publicly before everyone purchased them as gifts? Did Amazon and Google put a lid on the discussion? I gave three to family members after reading reviews in the Wall Street Journal and other media that said nothing about these concerns. Manoush, I assume that you are among the people who are particularly concerned that we're not talking about this more. Well, I think that that comment from your listener really illustrates the sort of like the way that we talk about technology, right? There's right now there is there's the consumer side, which is a how the product works. Is, is it effective? Does it do what it says it's going to do? So I read all those reviews, too, and it sounds amazing. And then you flip over to a different section of, you know, whatever website you're reading or if you're still reading, reading the newspaper. And that's where the privacy sort of legal societal discussion is taking place. And I think where we are need to be is a, a nexus. I mean, what we're seeing is that. Uh, these machines, yeah, they they do work beautifully, They, but we need to connect it to the cultural implications and have a broader discussion about how we balance the wonderful conveniences and information we can get with the sort of rights and questions. And so I would have loved to have seen a lot of those reviews include at least a line or two about some of the privacy concerns that there are. Because I know those same reviewers talk about those things. I talk to them, you know, out and about, right? I know that they're thinking about these things. Tom, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And, and one of the most important things that I think the public can do is, is ask these questions and, you know, for reporters, keep getting more and more answers from 
you know, the companies, the tech companies themselves as to how they're using this information. I mean, like the, the Amazon Echo, you know, murder case that, that I wrote about, uh, for, for me, it was an opportunity to really press into Amazon, what exactly are you guys collecting? How are you going to be able to use this? And what are the larger implications of it? And I think the more people raise these valid concerns and, you know, ask the companies, what are you doing with this information? The more they have to be as upfront uh, with the public about these things. So again, it, even if right now we may not be seeing this mass collection of audio data that, that some people are afraid of, um, it, it's entirely possible that it's going to happen and people people need to be vigilant about it. We got to Joshua, I just oh, saw, go ahead, sorry, I, I just saw that um, Mark Zuckerberg has said that his New Year's resolution is to go on sort of a listening tour of the United huh. States and talk to people. And I think it's partly because you know, between the echo chambers and filter bubbles, that fake news issues that we've been hearing about, there's pushback from the American consumer in a way that there there wasn't maybe a year or two ago. There is a sort of awakening that is happening of how powerful these devices and platforms can be. And so I would say one thing you can do if Mark Zuckerberg is coming to your town, go and ask him, how, do you, how does Facebook work? What are you looking for? Give Put the pressure on him if it is something that you use every day because you deserve those answers um, and also we're trying to figure them out we're doing a project with our listeners at the end of this month with NPR that we would love to invite people we're going to experiment with changing our behavior and seeing how it affects our concept of our technology and our privacy so I would invite people to join us there too well but I have to wonder how much of this responsibility do we just put on consumers to be smart consumers I mean I just what I while you were talking I just searched online Facebook terms of service and within that, I hit Control F to do fine, and I looked for the words audio, listen, hear, sound, microphone, and none of them was in the terms of service. So for me, that makes me think, okay, well, if Facebook is collecting audio information and using it to feed ads, they might be doing it outside of the terms of service. But it, the agreement would not have warned me about that. In fact, with some of these devices, as I found out yesterday playing with one of them, and I'm sorry to those of you listening because it's about to go off because I'm going to call <laughs> its name, if you ask, it'll actually answer the question. Alexa, are you recording me? I only send audio back to Amazon when I hear you say the wake word. For more information and to view Amazon's privacy notice, visit the help section of your Alexa app. So at what point do we put the responsibility back on ourselves and say, hey, if we want to know, we're the ones who have to start asking. Tom? Yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, before I answer your question, I thought uh, um, the Echo's response to your question was a little bit squirmy on her part because you asked, are you recording? And she said, I only send data to Amazon when you use the wake word. Well, that's not necessarily the answer to your question, though, because there is some data that is stored locally on the device. Uh -huh. I mean, not how much, but the, the fact is that the microphones are always on. Now, I'm not saying there is a catch of, of audio data on the device, but again, that is a part of the construction and engineering of the product that Amazon is not being clear about. And, you know, it's important for people to ask this of Amazon so that they will clarify these things. Mm -hmm. um, now, in, in terms of... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead, I was just going to yeah. say, they, yeah, I was just going to say that they change the terms of service all the time, and they don't, I think it's probably in the terms of service that they don't have to tell you when they change the terms of service. So that that could be something one guy told me, a listener, that his wife actually filed for divorce after Facebook changed its privacy settings and revealed that he belonged to an atheist Bible study group. You know, we don't, he thought he was being private and he wasn't. Hey Manoush, where are you going? Is there anyone, and I'm not asking you to be a name dropper, but just if there are resources that you know of that mm. are good for following terms of service, is there anyone in the tech press, and maybe Tom, you're doing this, who's actually covering these changes that the average person could just go watch or go to their website every now and then to keep up? Or is this yeah, a gap in journalism today? Uh, well, I think the problem is there's so long and there's so many of them. There was a researcher at Carnegie Mellon who found that it would take you more than 201 hours to read all the privacy policies you come across the year and that that was worth about three and a half thousand dollars per American internet user every year. Um, there are some great places doing uh, work. Epic, I would say, the Electronic Privacy Information Center in, in Washington near you. Um, EFF, um, Electronic um, Frontier Foundation as well. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of places. Uh, Mozilla is doing a lot of work on this too. The We're people gonna, who make Firefox. Exactly. Yep, they're doing work on this as well. Um, I don't know, Tom. What about you? What sort of resources do you go to? 
Well, we certainly write about it as much as we can at the information, but there are other news sites. I think um, ZDNet is one out there that's, that's mm -hmm. tried to kind of focus as much on, on Internet security as possible. And a few of the other consumer sites, you know, when a case similar to like the, the Echo one, which has kind of a more uh, consumery focus on it comes up, uh, they do a bit of... Uh, uh, reporting on it, but it's uh, it's tough to find, and I think you know the resources that you mentioned, certainly kind of consumer advocacy groups like that are, are probably the best way to go. Whose job it is specifically to kind of be a watchdog for these tech companies and provide as much information to the public as possible. We're low on time, so let's get to at least one more listener comment. Aaron tweeted us, "What about malware using these devices for cyber attacks?" Tom, what do we know about the potential for malicious actors to use these and do real harm? Boy, it's, uh, it's tough to tell right now. Um, Amazon and, and certainly Google want to make it as clear as possible that they have built these devices to be incredibly secure, that they're, it, it's, they'll say it's impossible for someone to hack into it. But if the sort of one thing that we've learned over the last few years with hackers is that nothing is impossible and they will always find a way. So you don't want to be alarmist about these things and say all of your devices are vulnerable right now and you could be, you know, the Russian government could be listening in on you right now. But the fact of the matter is when you're buying one of these things, you have a device that has seven microphones that are always on in your home. Um, and as good as the security that Amazon and the other tech companies have built in on it um, is, uh, there's just a possibility, a possibility that, that one of these things could be could be taken over uh, by some nefarious or, or potentially non-nefarious actor. And I don't know of any examples of this happening yet, but I almost want to say it's, it's, it could be a matter of time before we see you know, precedent set in the same way that, you know, the, the Amazon Echo being used in a murder trial is in a way precedent set for mm -hmm. how data collection of these devices can happen. Manoush, I understand that you do not have an Amazon Echo, nor are you on Facebook. Is that so? Yeah, no, I, for multiple reasons with Facebook, the creepiness factor, I just could never get over it. Um, it felt... Uh, it, too invasive to me, and I have to say, you know, I, I, every single day I was like, huh, maybe today's the day I get on Facebook. But as a tech journalist, every day I also learn more about what we don't know about how these things work, um, at ad targeting, uh, the potential for hackers, and um, so I've decided to hold off for now. We do have a nest at home, I will say. I have the smart regrets. thermostat. Yes, the smart <laughs> thermostat, but I have regrets. Oh, like um, right. Wait, you regret getting... Well, let me, let me ask you this, because we we got to land this plane in just a second. What's the one yeah. thing that the tech companies behind these speaking computers could do to convince you to put one in your home? Let me ask you both. Manoush? Well, I would like to see a HIPAA, you know, some sort of oath that we have for physicians, um, medical pro data. I would love to see the same thing for developers and for tech companies. So HIP, uh, just to clarify, HIPAA is the law that says that your health information belongs to you and no one has a right to see it unless you consent, right? That's correct, yes. So something comparable for the spoken data would do it for you. Mm -hmm. Tom, what about you? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to admit that I do have you know, an Amazon Echo in my house, and I'm also on Facebook, and probably give my data to tech companies in a myriad of other ways. So I'm probably at the, at the other end of the spectrum from Manoush, but what I really demand from, from these tech companies, and I think all consumers uh, should demand, is transparency. And, you know, the legal uh, agreements that you all click through absentmindedly when you get one of these things really isn't enough. I think there should be a much more clear statement on their part of exactly how this information is being used. Uh, my concern with, with the HIPAA agreements is that it just strikes me as something that will be violated. It's just the nature of these companies. I mean, we have to recognize that we are the product. As the user, we are the product. They are selling us to advertisers um, in order for marketers to reach us. And so I, I think all you can really do is be an informed consumer and for the tech companies, do everything that they can to make sure that the public is informed in a language, uh, you know, in a, in a level of disclosure that is easy to understand. And so we just know what we're getting into when we buy these devices. Because it's not... Yes, Tom, though, Tom, no, no, for no. the information. Tom, sorry to cut you off, but we got to end the hour. So thank right. you for being with us, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. And Manoush Zamarodi, the host of the podcast Note to Self from WNYC Studios. Manoush, thank you. What we've done, uh, namely engaging in civil disobedience uh, in opposition to Senator Sessions becoming Attorney General of the United States. So um, it, uh, it's quite a big, quite an experience, but uh, we thoughtfully broke the law so that we might have someone who will enforce all the laws as our chief law enforcement officer of the United States. Trump's pick has drawn widespread outrage because of Sessions' opposition to the Voting Rights Act. And they can ask questions for issue commands. There's something else this device does. Its microphone collects a lot of data on you and the people nearby. And that's why it's the focus of a legal battle in Arkansas 
Kelly, are you surprised by this development? I kind of figured this was going to show up in divorce court first. In this case in Arkansas, there was a murder. The cops noticed that there was an echo device in the house and they subpoenaed Amazon to get the data that was collected just in case the echo device heard anything that could be of help. Can you explain to us if these devices are really listening to us all the time? The device is listening for the cue. There's always a keyword that they're listening to, which means they're listening, but they're dumping all the data until they hear the keyword. Now, there have been people who have been creeped out because the device suddenly comes on when they didn't say the keyword, but I think that's pretty understandable because I, I, every time I talk to my phone, it never understands what I say. But we don't know exactly how much information they're storing because these are all private companies, right? So Amazon and Google, they tell us that they're not storing anything but we know that they must be storing something because these are data companies. Should we be worried? Well, we should have been worried a long time ago, right? Privacy advocates have been telling us to take precautions. Almost all of our devices have the, the ability to listen to us and watch us. Our phones, our new cars, our computers. Over the last year, there have been several moments where really powerful people have warned us. In September, the FBI director, James Comey, recommended that people cover up their webcams. And then last year, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, there was a photo of him at work, and in the background, observant internet followers noted that he had tape over his microphone jack and his camera. Tape, nothing sophisticated, just like black electrical tape. If Mark Zuckerberg or me or you, if we don't have anything to hide, why worry at all? What you really should be worried about is who is gathering information about you, what that information implies, is that information fair and accurate, and can it be used against you? My car insurance company recently asked me to put a tracking device in my car, suggesting that I'll get lower rates. I have no idea if the conclusions that they are coming to about my driving are accurate. What can people do to protect their privacy, whether it's in their living room or their kitchen or in their car? So read the FBI director's warning from last September and then decide for yourself how concerned you are. Consider next time you buy a shell for your laptop, buy one that has a built-in cover for the camera and the mic jack. Go into your phone settings and click on the privacy button and look at all the apps that you've set to allow to use the microphone, the camera, and the location services. And choose the setting that is least invasive. So it should be never or only while the app is on. That's some pretty smart advice, Kelly McBride. So where do you expect to see this cool but somewhat creepy technology showing up next? I'm just waiting for them to come into my bathroom. You're listening to the...